from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. Welcome to teaching social emotional learning through music. On this episode, we explore social emotional artistic learning. We welcome arts integration specialist and founder of the Inspired Classroom, Elizabeth Peterson. And now, our host of teaching social emotional learning through music, Scott Edgar. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. It is so rare that we have guests on this series that I want to say already get it. You know, oftentimes I'm put in a role of translator. It's what does this look like in your world? And then we translate it for the world of social and emotional learning or music education. Well, friends, we're in for a treat today because we have Elizabeth Peterson here who has created one of the most incredible models for embedding social and emotional learning into arts education. And we talk about just an unbelievable journey and how this is going, this message will resonate with so many. The journey that Elizabeth has had is going to be perfect and a message that we all need to hear. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Yay. Thank you, Scott. I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you and uh, talk about something that I know is really near and dear to both of our hearts and all the listeners as well. <laughs> So like-minded, so like-hearted. This is one of those special moments where I think we're just going to have a lot of fun. So, Elizabeth, awesome. I know that you have a background in music education, but that's actually not the world you're living in right now, right? You're a general no. education teacher. So tell us a little bit about your journey from, you know, maybe from the beginning of, you know, what was your inspiration to be an artist, a musician, and all the way up until now with Seal? Yeah, well, I won't start from the very, very beginning <laughs> where, you know, it was second grade starting off my piano lessons and all that. But when I became a senior and, and I did my massive senior recital in high school, I knew that I wanted to do something with music. I couldn't just let it go. I also knew I wanted to be a teacher. However, I didn't want to be a music teacher per se. I wanted to teach all the subjects. And so when I decided to go to um, college and was figuring out my major, fortunately I had to have a second major as an elementary ed teacher. And so I made that music. And I just wanted to learn everything that I could about music in college. And I, and I was set on that <laughs> path. And so um, a lot of the, my, my uh, peers kind of looked at me odd, you know, why are you just a music major? Why aren't you in performance? <laughs> why aren't you in music ed? And it was just plain and simple. I just loved music and I wanted to learn about it. And so when it came time for the senior sem of uh, graduating from college, you know, while everyone was doing their liner notes or doing their big practicums, my professor uh, allowed me to kind of explore a little bit and that's, where the whole idea of integrating music into what I was doing in elementary um, just started budding. And I started really exploring um, how listening to music could be embedded into what I was doing in my student teaching. And that's where it really started. Um, I had awesome cooperating teachers for my student teaching who allowed me to just test things out with all their kids, with all my kids, it was great. And so I developed a lot of lessons that had to do with listening to music, interpreting music, writing, uh, integrating math, just doing all that good stuff. Uh, and it actually became my first book called Inspired by Listening <laughs> and all the great ways that you can uh, incorporate that. And then when I was looking for a grad program, I stumbled upon arts and learning. And that's where I started to really get to open up to all the different art forms, get comfortable in them, like visual art, which, you know, I'm, I'm no visual artist, right? <laughs> uh, movement, poetry, media, just all these art forms. And I just ate it all up. And that, that was, I knew that that was gonna be my passion. Yeah. So that's how I got started with arts integration. <laughs> And then, you know, just uh, I, I could see how my students responded to all of this integrative work that I was doing. And then when I actually started teaching music, a couple of years into my career, um, I moved locations and wanted to, uh, you know, continue teaching and 
the music position kind of opened up. And um, then I started integrating the arts and language and all kinds of things into my music classroom. And so, you know, I'm a big proponent of integration for arts teachers as well, because I think that integrating the arts isn't just confined to a classroom teacher or a special ed teacher, but it really is for all teachers because it does nothing but great stuff <laughs> for the kids and for the teachers themselves too. Absolutely, Elizabeth. So let's go there. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll bring SEL into the picture in just a few seconds. But I think arts integration is something that a lot of people have heard. It's mm -hmm. another buzzword of, of things that we can start to explore how the arts can have a role beyond teaching quarter notes and beyond <laughs> brush strokes and shading. But I think there's a lot of people who are misinterpreting or misunderstanding what arts integration really is. So can you help us wrap our heads around what is this construct and what does this look like in your world? Yeah, so at the core, arts integration really is when you are taking the standards, the objectives that you have in your content and coupling it in a natural way, coupling it with the contents, standards, and, and objectives in another art form. And what you really want to do is look for that, um, I've heard it referred to as the elegant fit, right? So really making sure that it's fitting and you're not forcing it. Um, for example, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you have a group of students that are learning about weather and the clouds and you know that you have music that you know is inspired by clouds and weather and i, I know there's music out there that <laughs> that is composed for that you know to to find something find um movement standards find things like that that you can integrate connect uh very just naturally with it um and my my approach as a current teacher <laughs> is to make sure that the arts integration is practical and meaningful. It's got to be doable for a teacher because um, you can you can really spend a lot of time um, creating arts integrated lessons, but there's also some things that you can just do on the fly and just make those little moments meaningful for the kids. Um, and I have, you know, a lot of those kind of resources. One is like, uh, it's called arts integration in your back pocket and just pulling out little strategies that you can use at the drop of a hat in the moment, um, something really quick so that your kids are able to dig into your content, but they're also doing something creative and artistic. I adore all of this, Elizabeth. Yeah. So, you know, you and I both, um, I think, identify primarily as a musician in terms of an artist. Yeah. Um, I would say second for me would be theater. Uh, and then dance and visual arts probably would be a few train stops back. Yeah. Uh, from, from that perspective, though, when you're doing your work on arts integration, how much do you try to think in terms of multi modal arts or as opposed to just one artistic competency? Oh yeah, multimodal is gonna happen. <laughs> like with that cloud thing, then you can start drawing in visual art pretty quickly. Um, and something that I know a lot of teachers have a hard time with is, well, I'm not an artist. You know, I, I'm not a visual artist. Well, neither am I. But you know, I can't let that fear or that uh, limitation that I think I have limit what my students are capable of. I've had so many times where, you know, um, a student is showing interest in doing something or trying, uh, trying something, and it's something that I can't fathom doing, <laughs> like creating a whole, you know, landscape of the sky, whatever it might be. And, but I'll just say, okay, well, let's, let's give it a shot, right? Because even though I can't imagine myself doing it, doesn't mean that the kids can't. And, and, you know, my classroom is supposed to be this safe learning environment where kids can take risks, make mistakes, try things out. And I think that when you have that, I call it an arts integration frame of mind where you're just open to allowing your kids to try a few things, um, amazing things will happen. And it, 
positions the teacher in a space that we don't need to always be the expert. Yeah. You know, oftentimes we hold our students back when we think, oh, I'm not a visual artist, so we can't do visual arts in our classroom. Yeah. Uh, you know, the same is true for our music educators. Oftentimes we see this as a roadblock in composition or improvisation. It's, oh, I'm not a jazz musician, so I can't yeah. help my students learn how to improvise. And it's our own roadblocks that prevent our students. Elegant fit. Uh, not only am I in love with that phrase, I'm going to steal it because steal it, so perfectly, it so perfectly <laughs> captures what we're looking at for SEL. You know, where is mm. that organic moment of confluence where we can take our music education objectives and our SEL objectives? And you've given us some insight in terms of how we can have a third layer to this to really start to come together and give us something that is really cohesive. So we're going to meld everything together in just a second. But in yeah. your world, I know SEAL, as we start to unpack what this is going to look like, and we'll explain more about that in just a second. Sure. But SEL has come um, as something that is really important to you. So what does social and emotional learning mean to you? And why is music education the right place to explore it? Whew. Well, that's loaded. Social. <laughs> well, you know, you've got the definition of social emotional learning, right? And it, what it boils down to is how you deal with your own emotions, how you deal with your own self, how you work with others, how you make good decisions, right? And yes, that's based off of Castle's competencies. And I think that they do an amazing job of just putting it into good basic terms for teachers. Um, and let's see, what does it mean to me? Well, first and foremost, it has to mean something to me because my kids need it so badly. And it's not just in recent years of the pandemic, but it has been building for a decade, maybe a little more. And we've, we've seen it, like, right? I mean, if you've been in education for any amount of time, you've witnessed it like before your eyes where the kids are just needing more and more. Um, and some of it is in your face with classroom outbursts and some of it is subtle and is just so internal inside your kids. And so for me, social emotional learning is just a necessity. And if we're gonna survive <laughs> as teachers and as educators, we've got to figure out a way to kind of uh, transform how we do things. Um, and that's why uh, SEAL came to be because when when the administration started talking to my district's staff about oh this SEL thing and how we're gonna we're gonna start doing SEL um, you know all I could think of as she was like un unrolling all this information about what social emotional learning is all I could think of was everything you just said we can do with the arts absolutely everything there's so many applications and so with so yeah, let's talk about music, right? <laughs> so music is like the ultimate, uh, you know, I think personally, because it's about, well, first of all, you've got, you've got being able to listen to music, perform music, compose music, and music is so innately emotional. And it doesn't matter what part of that process you're part of, it's, it just becomes part of who you are and what you're doing in your experiences. And let me just see this, this amazing quote by Louis Armstrong, what we play is life. <laughs> and I think that just encapsulates it because it can be what we're playing on our Spotify account. It can be what we're playing out our horn. It can be what we're playing with others in, a, in an ensemble. And it just represents everything that is the human existence. So it's got that self part. And then of course, music is so innately social and it builds relationships like crazy. Um, I've, I've always dabbled in my uh, music classroom and then also in my general ed classroom, dabbled with um, drumming circles or percussion circles. And it's just like this, instant relationship builder, <laughs> this instant community builder. Um, and so I think there's so many applications 
that are at various levels of comfort for teachers as well um, to be able to bring music in and use it, explicitly use it for social emotional skill building. <laughs> I adore the term explicit because oftentimes mm. we look at the music classroom or the arts classroom and we say, yeah, we already do this. Yes. But when we make it explicit, yeah. when it's part of the planning process, yep. we're truly able to capture and define what we're doing. Give it the words that it deserves. Yes. And that's a huge part of SEAL is the explicit teaching. Um, and that's one of the big mind sh mindset shifts for anyone who is studying how to be a quote unquote SEAL teacher. And that is to really understand that, yes, you do this and yes, you can develop it further. But part of developing that skill of en encompassing uh, social emotional learning inside your classroom is being explicit with the kids. Because, I mean, I, I, we're kind of like at the point where you have to be blunt with the kids. Like you are not acting appropriately, but then taking it a step further, how do you feel right now? Like, you know, or taking that time after whatever incident has maybe happened and reflecting on it and bringing in some of that social emotional language to help kids to, to figure out what is going on inside them, around them, so that they can become more equipped to do better. Uh, the next time and, and and kids want to kids <laughs> want to do better i mean i think when we look at some of these behaviors that we're seeing so prevalently across the country right mm -hmm. now um it, it's not that the students want to misbehave often uh, right. <laughs> oftentimes this is the best that they can do you know mm -hmm. they, they are trying their hardest and they're they're craving for a space to improve to do better to have the capacity to have that management skill and to have something like music and the arts that can have both trains running at the same time is so special. Mm. You know, one thing that we're thinking about a lot uh, in our world is thinking about how when the definition of a musical education is limited to performance, Ooh. a lot of this becomes difficult. And when we broaden it to think about connecting, responding, and creating our other national core arts standards, mm -hmm. that a lot of this becomes heavily doable, if not conducive, and served on a silver platter. So agree with that. It, that was, yes, when it, when, and I think that has to do with like the outside world. What is music or music education to them? They want to see the performance, right? They want to see, oh, well, what outcome has come from this? You know, <laughs> is our money well spent in this programming? But yeah, that the behind the scenes of what it takes to get to the performance, but the also the, the social emotional part, the connecting, the responding, all that stuff, part of that creative process is, oh my gosh, like that that's it. The performance is just the cherry on the top, right? And um, yeah, I think that that's part of uh, what we need to do as advocates for music education is to really bring to light all the amazing things that kids of all ages are learning, regardless of what type of music education they're getting. Absolutely. And the way that all of this enhances each other, because I think some uh, right now are thinking, yeah, everything you're saying sounds really great, but if I spend time on this, I'm giving up time that's going to affect the musical product. And yeah. the answer that we found, and I I'm, would love to hear some of the uh, case studies that you have in SEAL, that we find that when people take that leap of faith and they say, okay, I'm gonna target that, this is important. I know it takes trust, it takes courage, but everything gets better, including the product. Yes. Yeah. You know, sometimes we just have to, and, and this is true across the board with like every teacher that I've worked with. <laughs> and I've been working with teachers and giving workshops and courses and retreats for 16 years now. And they're always worried that if I do something with the arts or if I take the time to do this, the academics are going to start to um, what, you know, fall by the wayside, but it takes the guts. It takes that first step to say, no, this is what my kids need, plain and simple. And, and you know what, this is also what I need as the teacher. 
I actually, I actually wrote an article on my blog. It's called How Studio Day Saved My School Year. And it's about how I, um, I created this thing called Studio Dates, where general ed teachers can take a chunk of their day, sometimes the entire day, if they have that flexibility, and really get your kids to go through the entire creative process beginning to end. It was kind of like seal before seal had already had been created. And I decided before state testing, no less, the week before, I said, forget this. We are taking a day. My kids look exhausted. We, we kind of need this. They're so like disconnected from one another. And we took an entire day and went through the creative process. We did a visual art activity in this case uh, with of course some carefully selected music for the background and reflection and all that good stuff. And from that, our, our class created like this um, set of new classroom guidelines that would help us to be better learners as we continued the school year. And I'm telling you, from that day on, for the next span of time, we were just so much more together. We were so much better prepared to take on the state testing because we had had that time of, it's kind of like, you know, taking a vacation. <laughs> we had that time to really focus on what we needed in those moments. Um, uh, work together, work individually, reflect together, learn about how we learn, and then continue on with the rest of our lives. And I think that that's important for teachers to just do, even if it's in a, a smaller bit, you don't have to take a whole entire day, but you know, just taking those time, that time to stop. Like sometimes you have to close your door and do what you know is right for your kids <laughs> and for yourself. Boom. Right? <laughs> Mic drop. Full stop. <laughs> yes. You, you know, I mean, it, and, and for me, I had a tangible moment in rehearsal on Monday when we have a concert coming up on Friday, and there are some things that aren't lining up how, you know, in an ideal world, I would want them to line up. But the question that I kept on asking myself is, how much better is it going to get at this point? And... <laughs> You know, could we get it cleaner? Yes, but how much anxiety would I be producing to get it there? And the the answer was, no. Put put the baton down. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this week. Let's talk about what else you got going on in your life. We took about twenty minutes just to deflate all of the tension that had built up in that rehearsal. And the last hour, everything that I had thought was not going to get accomplished happened so much faster. I love it. You yeah, know, there's like state, whether it's state testing or whether it's state contest for, you know, concert band or choir, uh, yeah. we're talking about the same thing. Exactly. So tell us, <laughs> tell us about SEAL. Oh, I can't wait. Okay. Uh, su such, such great work coming from you and your publications and your blog. And we'll make sure that we put all of those in the liner notes for this episode. Awesome. But please tell us about SEAL. All right. Yeah. So SEAL stands for Social Emotional Artistic learning um, and it's a method to it, it's really been built and evolved to become something that will empower caring teachers of really of all grade levels and all content levels and and we can talk about that a little bit in in a moment but empowering those teachers who care enough <laughs> who are also you know experiencing that they need to calm their classroom behavior um, or ease their teacher burnout by embedding creative and artistic social emotional strategies into the content that they're actually currently teaching without requiring them to implement an entire SEL program that takes up their precious class time. And there are some real, the, I think that that is the key right there is that, you know, it is embedded into what they're already doing and um, and then gives them some of that freedom to tr to try a few other things as well. And we can talk more and more about all that. <laughs> you, you know, so many things that you said there are, are little threads that I want to pull, and, and could be a, its own episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, my first question is because 
I firmly believe that no matter what we're doing with SEO, we need to realize that the teacher uh, and the adult SEO and the space that we're bringing into mm. the environment needs that. That's part of this equation. You, you brought up teacher burnout, which we know is just prevalent. So maybe we start there. Maybe yeah. we start there with just this idea. Uh, how have you seen SEAL help teachers maybe reinvigorate? maybe rethink, reconceptualize the space, give them a little bit more energy? Yeah. It's been amazing. Like SEAL started as a bunch of activities and strategies that teachers can use, and it's evolved into the whole first phase of the training, so to speak, um, is all about the teacher, because the teacher is by far the most important part of the classroom. And I think that's what administrators need to start realizing, that it's not about the program, it's about the teacher, period. Um, and so that it, so it takes that idea of the teacher being in the front, uh, in, in contact with the, the kids day in, day in, day out, all the time, and really helps them to see their importance, to understand what their role is, give them some tools to really wrap their brains <laughs> around that because that's pretty heavy, right? It's pretty heavy stuff, especially knowing the kinds of needs that our kids have um, and giving them some tools. Um, and I think I mentioned before some mindset shifts that can really help them. Um, and the teachers that have gone through the course um, will say things like, you know what? It doesn't change the tough days because they still come, but I can handle it. I've learned, or they might say, I've learned to really set my boundaries and it's made a huge difference. And just those kinds of things that, that to quote unquote, teacher self-care, that, that type of stuff is just so important. It's being thrown around a lot, you know, and, and that's kind of, uh, that can kind of minimalize it. But if we get to the core of what that actually can look like, it can make such a huge difference. So it's not about, you know, going to a yoga class and just taking a couple of deep breaths. We're talking about real stuff here. One of my favorite quotes that I've seen bantered about, because I do believe, uh, agree with you, that self-care has almost been weaponized. It's almost been mm. like, oh, so why don't we have you take care of yourself so you can be productive again, as opposed to self-care because we need it self-care yeah. because if we're bringing all of this tension and, and burnout into our educational spaces and we see our students elevating we think those two things are not related yeah. absolutely right? when we're bringing attention into the space you know we have a five-year-old in our house and i am the first to admit that when my elevation of emotion gets up to like a, a high space and he, you know we start to get a meltdown Come on, Scott. <laughs> Those two things are related. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely, as we're seeing this, all of these mindset shifts. So you mentioned those mindset shifts. Yeah. Let's go in that direction. What else uh, are, are key uh, tenets of SEL from a mindset shift perspective? I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one that has really changed a lot of um, teachers' uh, mindset, <laughs> and that is uh, the sense of control what you actually have control of and what you do not. And we talk about, we talk about it, we discuss it, we do, we do art around it. I mean, this is like, you know, I, I'm a huge proponent of teacher centered professional development. So my SEAL teachers, they go through stuff that's for them. It's built for them. And so we talk about control and we, and we really investigate like what are certain things that you do have control of in your classroom, in your school, with your administrator? Uh, what are things that you can just let go of because it's just not going to change? And what do you have control of and what can you start to change to make just life better for you um, and, and uh, be able to survive <laughs> in your classroom on those tough days? And what can you let go and walk away with, walk away from? Because um, I'm going to I'm going to say this and uh, some teachers may be offended at first, okay? But as teachers and I and I see it I've seen it in myself <laughs> and I've seen it in colleagues and peers over the years and I've worked in a few different schools and and everything. But some teachers will dwell on speculation 
or they'll dwell on problems that are happening that they just don't have any influence on or just don't have any any um, uh, any control over at all and they tend to go down rabbit holes and you can it, once you know this and you can look for it you can see the overwhelm and the frustration just go up and then if you have a group of teachers talking about this it can get even harsher and that's not to say you can't talk about certain things but when you talk to it talk about it to a point where it's it's affecting you that's when it becomes unhealthy and you have to be able to see that in yourself <laughs> and and be able to either physically walk away or kind of just start to shut down the conversation in your head and walk away from it mentally let it end and then know that you've just taken care of yourself <laughs> that self-talk though and that process mm. and you know exactly what you just said it's a skill right that doesn't happen on accident it's not uh, a switch that you flip you have to have that in your toolkit to be able mm. to de-escalate that temperature absolutely so powerful so, you know, we, we've kind of focused a little bit on, you know, the teacher side of the equation. So for a teacher who really wants to go in and talk me back if I'm not approaching this the right way. Sure. But if someone wants to get into the classroom and do SEAL, yes. what would that look like? <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So we have a whole slew of different strategies. And I think I mentioned I know I mentioned that it really works for all grade levels, all content areas, because I'm a firm believer that if a teacher t attends professional development, they are making the modifications in their head. And I think the arts um, are certainly a vehicle for being able to modify and adapt it to fit the kids that are in front of you for whatever content they've got. Um, and so first and foremost, we have embedded strategies and these are strategies that you can use um, anytime all day um, just about every day um, things that just become part of your classroom culture um, for example um, movement right okay so being able to move and get your body ready for learning and I do this absolutely every day with my math group because uh, as a third grade teacher, um, I'm fortunate that my team uh, allows us to uh, move from math groups so that we can group kids who need the same thing. And I, I think that's an amazing thing to do, even as early as third grade. Um, but because they're shifting classrooms, which is, you know, a new thing for third graders, we get ourselves in the mood for math with movement. And we do a whole series of, and it's quick, a whole series of movements and because it's become part of the culture of that class it moves quickly and it does the job it gets them ready and focused and into their into their seats and ready to start listening to the teacher um, and you know we can integrate the movement with uh, math moves you know so we're making parallel lines and we're stretching and we're standing like an isosceles triangle and just you know we're bringing in all that good vocabulary but we're also getting our bodies ready so there's those embedded strategies that work uh, for music, it's soundtracking and being able to use the right type of music at the right time. Um, and that takes training, especially, if, you know, it takes training regardless of <laughs> and planning and, and getting, you know, the right kind of music to soundtrack your classroom. But um, that is probably one of uh, the teacher's favorites is being able to utilize music in a real purposeful way. Um, and, and you know, just help their students with the different ways that they need to be during during a class time or during their during their day. I absolutely love the teacher agency that I, I'm hearing right now, that there's not one right way to do it, that there's there, there's these approaches, these ideas, and that the teachers are able to make that organic in their own space for their own levels, for their own individual student needs. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's hugely important because you've got different teacher, uh, not just subjects and grade levels, different personalities, different teaching styles, 
and of course, different students in front of them. Like I, I remember as a music teacher and even as a classroom teacher, every single year, you know, you get a new class or every, every 45 minutes, you get a new class and it's like, it's a brand new class. It could be sixth grade after sixth grade after sixth grade, but the classes kind of get their little personalities and you have to deal with them differently. And so <laughs> what you, you start to understand, you know, okay, I need to find something that's going to work for this class and then something different for the, the next class. And it just gives you, gives you that arsenal of um, ideas to, to make it work. <laughs> that toolkit, absolutely, yeah. it expands that toolkit. Perfect. You know, one of the things that that we're champions of is we, we say for SEL and arts education to be uh, really powerful, it needs to be embedded, intentional, sustained. Those are the yes. three big things that need to be present. We've heard you talk a lot about the intentionality. We've heard you talk about how it needs to be embedded into a way that you say the elegant fit. Absolutely. What would be your answer to this? How much time needs to be devoted to SEAL? Gotcha. <laughs> and yes, so when you get yourself equipped with that mindset and the embedded strategies that are going to work, it could literally be, if you're in a, if you have just a class, it could be the five minutes. It really, really can be. And the trick to that has to do with your sustainability is consistency. You can't just do it once and say, oh, well, that was okay. Or do it once, you're like, that was amazing. And then forget about it and never do it again. <laughs> or do it once or twice and go, these kids hate this. I'm not doing this again. You have to be consistent. You have to kind of like be the teacher that is playing that entrance song when they come in. Or you have to be the teacher that <clears throat> allows the kids to get up and stretch so that their bodies and their minds are ready for learning. And once you have that consistency, that's when those strategies literally take one to five minutes tops because the kids are in that type of routine that really works, um, works for all of you. Right, so these little nuggets that then get strung together, right? So it might just yeah. be the end, and then it starts to be part of our culture. And it that's does. when I think it starts to just become something really special. Uh, Elizabeth, I know that all of our listeners and viewers right now are saying, how can I get more information? How can I get more information <laughs> about you and SEAL? So where can we go to learn more? Excellent. Yeah, so I have a great resource that I think your listeners will enjoy. It's called The Five Ways the Arts Are Integrated with Social Emotional Learning. Um, and you can get it at theinspiredclassroom.com forward slash five, the number five ways. So five ways. Um, and it's a great uh, resource. It's got some activity ideas for all four major art forms, music, dance, drama, and music, dance, drama, visual art, <laughs> with all five of the um, castle's competencies. So it's got some activity ideas, and it's also a tool for advocacy. So there's a lot of great information, and there's also, um, it's almost like a, uh, a little place where you can kind of think about how can I personally advocate for this stuff because it is just so important. Um, so, you know, if your colleague or your administrator walks by and kind of gives you that eye of what is going on in here, <laughs> you, you've got, you've got the, you get the response. <laughs> That's my favorite moment. If someone looks in my classroom and says, what's going on? I know I'm doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite quotes is, um, I can't remember. I wish I could remember the book I found it in, um, but it was something like, um, your classroom should sound like a really good cocktail party. <laughs> it really should. You know, I, I mean, I call it organized chaos. That if I walk into a yes. quiet classroom, I get really scared really fast. I'm like, what is going on? And what's the emotional effect of what mm. is leading to that just stoicness? You know, learning should not be stoic. Learning should be involved and empowered. Oh, yeah. uh, Elizabeth, we are so, so on the same page with everything that we've been talking about today. <laughs> Do you have awesome. any final thoughts before we, we send everyone off? 
Uh, well, you know, we just scratched the surface of what SEAL is. And so I really would love uh, for people to find out more. Um, and, you know, I think that the biggest thing that we need to remember is as educators, we need to really do what's best for our kids and for ourselves. And we need to start finding our voice. And I think that might start for some people, our internal voice <laughs> to stand up for what they know is gonna work for their kids in their classes. And then it will start to come out a little bit more in the things that you do and the, and the things that you're able to say. But you have so much um, impact on your kids and so uh, during those school hours, because we need our boundaries, but during those school hours, you know, just go about what you're doing and you're going to make the impact that you want, even if you never hear about it. <laughs> it's happening. That's powerful. You know, we, we really have no idea what the impact is long term. And mm. uh, but we hear the stories. We hear the stories. We see the faces. And these are the things that our students are going to remember. These are the things that our students are going to come back 20 years, come back and visit us and say, do you remember? And we're going to say, no, but they will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so true. So true. Oh, Elizabeth, such a powerful uh, time. And I can't wait to see how our paths can collide more moving forward. But thank Certainly, you so much Scott. for being our guest today. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you for inviting me on, Scott. I've loved, this is like my favorite topic to talk about. So I think uh, it was a great uh, opportunity to come talk to you. Absolutely. Perfect. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Please be safe and be well. All right. You too. Thanks, Scott. How amazing was it to start to understand how arts integration, SEL, music education, and SEAL can come together for both student and teacher empowerment? I so want to thank our guest for today, educator, entrepreneurship, creator of SEAL, Elizabeth Peterson. She's given us such powerful perspective on how social and emotional learning, music and arts education can come together in an organic, elegant way to help us and our students move forward. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you. From Music for All and our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America, thank you for joining us for this episode of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music. Yamaha is your partner in music education, not just through instruments and professional audio, but also through teacher resources and support. Visit YamahaEducatorSuite.com as your go-to source for your music program needs and professional development. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through music for all. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. We are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed this episode of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, and in order for us to continue providing our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider giving to Music For All in any amount at musicforall.org backslash give.